All right, good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started in the interest of time. So we have plenty of time to go through the, the discussion portion of this today. I uh, appreciate everyone being here. This is a great day. This is a very exciting day. Um, we're going to talk about, we've got a special guest here today that you'll do a skill statement with. Um, some of you all have heard about it. Some of you all probably haven't, especially the new, the young. I know we've got some EMT soon to be graduates in the, in the audience today. Um, but Dominic from Edwards Life Sciences is here today with this new hemosphere monitor. It's a monitor that we use in the hospitals. A lot of the hospitals in the area are buying these to use in critical care situations, so patients in shock, uh, high risk surgeries, um, things of that nature. Um, and this monitor is kind of new technology. Dominic's going to go over it with you today in the back, so I'm not going to steal this thunder. Um, but I've demonstrated we're going to roll it out probably starting tomorrow on the supervisor truck. Uh, but essentially, it gives you, and we'll talk about in the talk, it gives you um, basically a non invasive way to see advanced hemodynamic monitoring, which is really exciting with a finger probe. And that's it. So, this is going to really be a game changer. So, we're going to be trialing this thing for the next uh, couple of months uh, here at Community. And we're the first agency in the country uh, that's ever used any of this kind of technology. So, this is pretty cool stuff. Um, so anyway, more about that, but we'll get started. The reason we wanted to do trauma training, well, it's summertime, right? So we're in the middle of trauma season. Um, we've had a few calls lately where um, things went okay, but after reviewing the records and talking to some of the crews, there's things we can improve on a little bit. Um, I think it's, you know, we get a little complacent occasionally. This happens at the trauma center too. Um, I had a multiple gunshot wound come in the other night at four in the morning. He arrived um, from the ER combative with barely one IV up here in his arm, right below the blood pressure count. Uh, that was barely working. That's what I had to deal with operating. Um, so we're going to talk through some of these principles, okay? Uh, but this stuff can get very challenging and, and it gets slippery. It goes downhill pill in a hurry. So we have to refresh and review and constantly kind of remind ourselves what we need to prioritize when we're dealing with someone who's dying in front of us, okay? All right, so Tate and I are put this uh, presentation together for you guys. We're going to go through a couple of cases. This is going to be more discussion format. Okay, we're not here to lecture to you about trauma. That's not the point of today. The point of today is to discuss some actual cases and figure out what, what you all think the process is, okay? We also want to dispel some myths that are out there about uh, managing trauma patients. Um, there's a lot of, there's been some protocol changes lately. We're going to talk about those. But I want to make sure at the end of today, we're very clear on what is myth out there about managing trauma, okay? Um, and what you should be doing, the right things you guys should be doing. But this is leading uh, kind of research right now, and this is uh, best practice, right? Based on what we're doing in the trauma centers, okay? And with life work. All right, uh, we'll talk about initial management situations, physiological considerations, pharmacological considerations, particularly with RSI of these patients. Uh, and then uh, we'll have time, plenty of time for discussion, Q&A and that sort of thing. And then we'll do our training stations, okay? Um, all right, so this is case one, okay? These are cases we did here at Community Park, okay? This is a 15-year-old male found down in the front yard of our residence. Gunshot wounds the neck as reported to dispatch, okay? Um, and because of bystanders. Uh, upon arrival, a medic unit patient was going to be unresponsive, blood on the right side of the neck, suspected GSW, okay? BVM was assisted for respirations. They could not get pulses. Uh, they got the monitor on pretty quickly. It was asystole in the monitor. Uh, patient was still warm, probably had just lost all vital signs at that point before they got there. Um, CPR was in initiated and the leukus was prepared. Okay. Now, what do you guys think? What, what would y'all do to start this? How, how, if you see this presentation and you walk up in the front yard and see this patient laying there, what are your priorities at that point? What is your first, very first priority after seeing safety? And they said you're safe to come in. Major bleeding. Yes, major bleeding. What does that mean? Major bleeding. How do you find major bleeding on this patient? Expose the patient. Yes, we have to expose the patient immediately, right? When, how do you expose patients immediately? EMT students, you guys know this, right? What do you do? What should the engine crew EMT be doing right now? Not the paramedic, the engine crew. Disrobing that patient, getting their trauma shears out and cutting clothes off. 
right? While the medic is doing a quick initial trauma looking for major bleeding, right? So a basic EMT should be getting trauma shears out and taking all the clothes off right now, quickly, as quick as you can. And we're gonna go over some of that today. We'll review in tech medicine and in the military, constantly reviewing the best way to cut off uniforms, to cut through clothes, to get the belts off, all that kind of stuff, okay? So how would y'all disrobe this patient? Let's say he's got jeans on and a t-shirt. You starting from the top down, or you starting from the bottom? Top. Do you think it's the easiest way to cut? Let's say he's got a big leather belt on and jeans. Yeah, you usual, right? Like almost a lot. Okay. Anyone? Option. <laughs> Top here. Go ahead, feel free to speak. This is a discussion format. I say box down. Yeah, I mean, there's no probably, it depends on the situation, right? And where you can get quickest, right? But, you know, if they've got a belt on trauma shears, it takes you a minute to get through a pair of a, a leather belt or a thick belt, right? So if you can somehow get that belt undone and take it out quickly, that's probably the easiest. Um, but you could start from the top and cut straight down the leg or come up the other way. But the key is, is you've got to be able to see that patient, right? Because where, where are you going to miss gunshot wounds? Where, have y'all ever missed a gunshot wound when you're on the assessment? I have. <laughs> we, we miss them at the trauma center almost weekly, right? And so we turn the patient, get them trauma negative, and turn them and roll them and look. Because if you don't do that, you're going to miss them. We've had gunshots up the buttock that go into the pelvis. Okay, there's no one now, right? And they wonder why they're still hypotensive when we get in the trauma center and looking for them, looking to find another gunshot somewhere that we missed in the field. Okay, it wasn't reported to the emergency department staff until we looked for that wound, right? Uh, there's a story I like to tell from when I worked in Maryland at the Shaw Trauma Center in Baltimore. I had an assault patient come in one night, in the middle of the night. He was aware, he was talking, you know, he was a little out of it, but he got some pain medicine. And I was doing my secondary assessment in trauma, there, and I decided to pop the C collar off. No reason, just wanted to look. And I looked behind his neck, and there was some dry blood behind his neck under the C collar. So I got an alcohol prep, and I wiped that blood away, and it was an ice pick wound in the back of his neck from the ice pick. He'd been shanked with ice pick um, and assaulted by a couple of people. So. If you don't look for that kind of stuff, you're going to miss it, okay? So you've got to disrobe your patient. Bottom up, top down, it doesn't really matter. It's dealer's choice. So however you can get those pants off, right? And that shirt has to come off, all right? So then what? So you're looking for massive bleeding. How do you initially look for massive bleeding on someone laying in the yard like that once you start getting clothes cut off? <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. And we talk about blood sweeps and tack medicine, right? Where in number two, we talk about blood sweeps. So you have your gloves, right? So hopefully your gloves aren't bloody already, okay? Um, but if you can, with, with a fresh pair of gloves that doesn't have blood on them already, once the clothes come off, you can start rolling and look at the back, but do blood sweeps. You want to grab down the legs, the arms on the back, and we'll go over that today in skill sessions, okay? But you got to look for blood that is actively coming out of the body, right? So what do you do after you do your initial blood sweeps? If you find blood somewhere, what do you do? How do you stop it initially? Right. So how are you, who's going to do that? The EMTs. This is the EMT skill, okay? A paramedic in charge at that scene does not need to be treating wounds at that point. The EMT needs to be directed to do that. Okay, and that's going to become a department expectation. All right, so the medic needs to be directing people on what to do as they're assessing that patient, right? So direct pressure, if it's anywhere in the thorax, what are you going to do? Please a seal, right? So wipe all that blood away and get a seal on there as quick as you can, okay? And this is not like a rushed procedure. Just be methodical, right? Okay, I need a chest seal. Someone, someone give me a chest seal. Get it open, wipe the blood away so it sticks on there nicely and just put it on there, okay? Same thing on the back, right? So if you're looking at the front of the patient and blood streets real quick, what do you need to do now immediately once you've got the clothes? Roll the patient, right? 
Hold the patient. So you've got maybe a hold the patient up in the back. Okay? And we're doing this all in real time. So it goes quickly. Okay. This is not, it seems like this takes a long time if we're talking about that. But this should all be happening methodically, but in a in a you know deliberate way. Okay. Same thing we do in the trauma center. All right. So roll the patient. You've got to look for more wounds. Okay. You got to look in the buttocks. The waist area, okay, and you got to come up the back and you got to look behind the neck, right? All these areas, and don't forget the scalp, all right? Look in the scalp too, because you might miss uh, something in the head too. Yeah. We missed the GSW last week um, that went through the arm and okay. it, and it into the abdomen, but she was moderately obese. And even though we had sat her up and looked at the back side of her, these, these rolls, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. fat. Sure. Sure. It, we never and it happens. Separating yeah. it and right. That's where it was. Yeah, perfect. Thanks for mentioning that. That's awesome. See, that's exactly what I'm talking about. That's a great example. So, and it, and it will happen. We're, you know, we're not perfect. We will miss wounds occasionally. But what's important is if you is if you don't miss the big wounds. Okay, the ones that are going to kill the patient. Right. So, where are the wounds typically going to kill your patient first? Yes. Near things, big arteries that bleed quickly, whether it's internally, the abdomen, the chest, or, or uh, junctional areas, right? And the armpit and the places like that, right? So those are places you have to really pay attention to. That's why it's so important to disrobe that patient as quickly as you can, okay? Get them naked. You've got to look at that patient, all right? Because you will miss wounds. Um, all right, so what's next? What are you all going to do after that? And then we'll kind of move along to the next slide. So you've done blood sweeps. You've looked for all the wounds on the front. You've rolled, looked on the back, right? You're happy. Nothing's externally hemorrhaging at this point, right? So now what? What are your next priorities? Yeah. Yeah. So now you've got bleeding control, right? So now we can start assisting the patient's ventilation. So you've got to start with massive hemorrhage. You have to do that first. That's what's going to kill the patient. The it's not the airway. Okay, yeah, they need assisted ventilation, I get, but bleeding out is what's going to kill them. They're already, this patient's already almost bled out, right? They were already like behind the eight ball at this point. So we have to be super aggressive with stopping any further bleeding so we can start giving blood to this patient, okay? Because that may be their chance of life at that point, giving them blood, right? Uh, okay, so then what? So you're going to assist ventilations, right? And then what do you do at that point? Are you going to move the patient now? Or are you going to stay there and play there? What do you think? Move the patient. Where, where would you move the patient? Or how would you move the patient? Well, I personally, whenever we rolled them, probably would have put them on a backboard right then and there. So that way I already have my movement. So that way okay. I can start going downtown. Okay. Or that's right. That's fine. Yeah. So be directed. Don't forget to direct people to do stuff, right? Because what happens a lot is, is people just, they don't have a job, right? So they're kind of standing around watching, right? So try to be useful, right? Try to ask, hey, what can I do? Can I go get something for you? Do you need a backboard? Do you need an ambu bag? Oxygen with the ambu bag connected, right? We are still right now in a basic EMT management of this patient. Basic EMT skills is what we're doing to manage this patient, right? Wound packing, chest seals, assisted ventilations, disrobing, all that stuff, right? So we're nowhere near any advanced paramedic skill at this point, right? So you have to fall back on your basic stuff that you've been taught as a basic yet too, right? Um, what, what are the things that are gonna kill this patient the fastest? We already talked about the first one, massive hemorrhage, right? What else is gonna kill this patient? What's the next thing that will kill them after massive hemorrhage? Okay, so that causes shock, right? But shock's a delayed death, right? That doesn't happen immediately. What happens really quickly? Bleeding to death from arteries, right? So tourniquets, right? That's why we get tourniquets on so quickly, right? Direct pressure, tourniquet if you think it needs a tourniquet. Wound packing, right? All that stuff, basic EMT stuff. Would y'all say, would you say back there? Asphyxia. I'm sorry? Asphyxia. Uh, yeah, so asphyxia. Yeah, so airway obstruction. Right, so lack of oxygen, right? So massive hemorrhage, any kind of airway obstruction, right? So not breathing, right? So we do have to fix that at some point after we stop massive hemorrhage and look for holes in the patient, okay? And then what else? Kind of goes with along with asphyxia that we're talking about. Yeah, caused by what though? 
He said VQ mismatch, right? Ventilation perfusion mismatch. And what's the one that will kill the patient the fastest? Anyone? Anyone? What? Perfusion. Yeah, but perfusion is like, I mean, what, what can cause a lack of perfusion besides blood on the street? It's gone. You lose your blood on the street, that's lack of perfusion, right? You have no pulses now, so that's a problem. But what else causes lack of perfusion? Pneumothorax. Pneumothorax, right? Sension pneumothorax. That's a big EQ mismatch, right? That's where the lung is, is collapsed so much, right? That it starts, there's so much air in the portal space that it starts pushing against the media sinus in the middle of your chest where all your blood vessels and your heart lives, right? And it pushes everything so much you get no venous return to the heart and you go into a rest. Okay. So massive hemorrhage. Right, massive airway obstruction or lack of ventilation and oxygenation of the airway. Tension pneumothorax. Those are the things you're going to kill your patient with fastest. All right, so does this patient need a tourniquet? Probably not, right? Because you've looked, you don't see any bleeding wounds on the, on the extremities, right? Do they need direct pressure? Maybe. Was it GSW in the neck or was it? It was blood not. It was, it was blood that was on the neck that they thought was a GSW. So if you see blood coming out of a wound, then it needs pressure, right? And maybe wound packing, maybe, right? But if it's in the chest or back, it needs a chest seal, right? Um, and we'll talk about wound packing during the skill stage. All right. So, and then maybe needle decompression, right? So we have a wound on the right chest that was noted on a delayed secondary assessment because they were focused on CPR and getting the Lucas set up. What's the problem with CPR and getting the Lucas set up in this patient right now? It's a traumatic arrest. You've got to be able to access to the back and the chest, right, to do procedures, to recheck chest seals. You can now, someone should be doing chest compression. So then you're off, but that's a, you know, it's one on the injury group. Or a basic on the ambulance should be down there doing chest compressions. Once you've done the roll, you've stopped bleeding, you put chest seals on, back seals, wherever you find holes, right? Now we can manage airway and CPR. Okay. Uh, so we'll talk more about the Lucas. Tate's going to talk more about the Lucas with Life Flight, their protocol, our protocol here, and how we should be doing this thing. Okay. All right, so we're going to go ahead. There was another gunshot wound that's later found also on the left thigh. Uh, right proximal tibia IO was placed. Um, epi fluids, you know, it's an arrest now, right? So one of the myths is that you can't use epi and cardiac arrest from trauma. That's absolutely wrong. Okay, it's the first drug you use in the trauma center once one of the rest would die. So if they arrest, that be is indicated. It's now a cardiac arrest. Okay. So we treat it like an arrest. Okay. But we need access, right? So we need access the best we can get it. So where are your access sites for this patient now? So we're doing CPR. We're managing the airway with basic either an eye gel or an oral airway in an AMBU bag. Okay. We've not innovated this patient at this point, all right? Because that's not our priority right now. Okay. Our priority is just ventilation and oxygenation. Okay. So now, access wise, where are you guys going to put access in this patient? Humoral head IOs. Humoral head, right? And then if you have a medic that can, or an advanced DMT that can start looking for a good IV site, have them do that. But don't, don't worry as the lead medic or medic in charge or supervisor. You know, you can dive in and help with access if they're struggling, but try to get other hands in there looking for an IV, looking for a vein. Okay, so your hands aren't tied up focusing on trying to find an IV. Okay, where else besides IO, um, proximal and humerus? Distal femur. Uh, yeah, so humeral head, distal femur, sure. Adults, we can, you know, attempt that. If people's legs are kind of big, though, it may be hard getting deep into that distal femur, but you can attempt that. Where else can you go? Where we've been going for years? Tibia. Tibia, right? So you can do that, too. That's not as good, but it's a sight, okay? 
So if we can get more than one IO in quickly, that's preferable. So you get two sites, right? So we can get at least blood started. Hopefully the blood we can connect to the humeral head because that's the best site to start blood products. Where else can we look for in a peripheral IV? Good. EJ, exactly, right? So EJ, if they have enough blood. Now this guy's bled out pretty quickly, right? So he may not have enough blood left to even see it. But how can you position this patient? It's hard during CPR, but if you can, you can try to put them a little bit head down, the legs up, the old shot position. Might be just enough blood to make that EJ pop up a little bit where you can try an EJ, okay? Does this patient need to be back forwarded and c -colored? A bunch of blank stairs. <laughs> it's not a trick question. It's not a trick question. Basic EMTs. We're still basic EMT land right now, right? You guys are the rock stars on this patient land. Sorry? He was found unconscious. He was found down unconscious, unresponsive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I've got one vote for C collar just in case. Now, came out as a gunshot wound to the neck. Does that change things the way you're? But just simple question. If you have a gunshot wound in the neck, do you think they should have a seat color? No. Yes. Raise your hand, yes. Raise your hand, no. Raise your hand, I'm not sure. <laughs> Can I phone a friend, buy a bell? Okay. <laughs> should I call Doc? <laughs> right. All right, the answer is no. This patient does not need a seat collar and gun. I had one last night. He got shot uh, right here. No exit wound, uh, no blood in his airway. He was still awake. But we palpated his neck and he was tender to his neck. He was subcutaneous emphysema. We put a C collar on and luckily we did because it was lodged in the back of his neck, C1 and C2. So this patient, he's already, he or she, or she is already dead, but that's just, just something to think about too is if you have somebody who is kind of like shot in this area and there's no exit wound and they're awake and able to tell you that there's pain here that's a, yeah that's consider. a different case. that's a different case that's i'm just speaking case, right? yeah but that's hey thanks for bringing that up so uh, that's a different scenario if you're alert talking to you saying they have neck pain you know you feel something that's lumpy and abnormal then yeah that's the call. absolutely but this case right here it's not the use of it. Okay. So, okay, it's a and it's this way that you see the arm that you can um, The odds of having a C spine wound into the a uh, cervical injury and, and uh, conflict injury in the patients is very slim. Okay. That's an exception. Yeah. It's a different case. It's just it's something to consider. Cases. So, I'm not saying never put a C collar on someone with a wound to the neck. That's not what I'm saying. But this case, if there was a wound in that here, I wouldn't think very much about this. Penetrating trauma, we've essentially gotten away with C spine and backboard on every level. It's a waste of time unless you're moving the patient, right? So if you want to move the patient on a board, perfect. Move the patient on the backboard to get on the stretcher. That's great. No problem. Take it out of the hospital or in life like this. Okay. So no problem. But you don't need to be treating these patients with a C spine precautions. Okay. So that's one of the myths that we need to discuss. Okay. Um, so around the country, we're getting away from C spine for penetrating. Okay. Now they didn't have a wing the neck. They thought they did, right? But they didn't have it. So even less need for AC tolerance, right? Okay. All right. Uh, all right. So we'll move along here. Um, so then, so we get access, right? We talked about access sites. All right. Now, what are our priorities? Now we got access. Uh, we can. You know, depending, there's, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about, Tate's going to talk a little bit more about RSI and, and innovating and when to do that and all that. But what is your priority now? We got access. We've probably loaded the patient in the back of the ambulance at this point, right? We're doing CPR. We reassess, right? Make sure your chest seals are still placed. Anytime you move a patient, reassess your interventions. That's so critically important. I can't tell you how many times this happens almost weekly to hospital. And it drives me crazy. They rush into the OR and the nurses from the ER say, I'm sorry, we lost an IV coming up to the OR. 
And I'm literally, it makes my blood boil because they do it all the time. When they're moving patients and rushing them off, they're going to make pull out lines. And it happens all the time. And it's, it's just really frustrating. So please make sure your interventions are protected once you put them in, okay? Move the patient methodically, move them deliberately, but don't rush, okay? Rushing is when we get sloppy, and it's when we make mistakes, right? When we rush and we miss things and we pull lines out and things like that, okay? So just make sure you protect your interventions. When you move a patient from point A to point B, reassess all your interventions, okay? All right, so what's next? What's next on our priority list with this patient? You're in the back of the ambulance. Um, you've probably called life flight at this point. They're in route. You've got a few minutes to play um, or drive to where you're going to life flight, but you got time with the patient now. So what are your priorities at this point? Thermal regulation. Yes, thank you. So hypothermia, right? <laughs> we always forget hypothermia. What do we do in Houston in the summertime with our back of our ambulance? Make it a refrigerator, right? Right? It's cold back there. Turn off the AC, please. Turn off the air conditioning. It's going to get warm. It's going to get uncomfortable. That's good for your patient. You need them warm. Cover them up at this point. Once you've assessed them and stopped all bleeding, keep them warm. Okay? So, yes, thank you. That's a huge one that we forget about. All right? Um, in the hospital, we use forced warming weapons. Okay. All right. What's next? What's your next priority? So, you're... Trying to keep the patient warm. Hopefully, supervisors there with good stuff, right? What do they have? So, what else do we push? You don't have to leave the slide. It's on the slide, <laughs> right? So, TXA, right? So, we're going to do that. We're going to get our blood set up, start our blood products, reevaluate re our chest seals, make sure they're still working. Life lights on the way, okay? Um, and oh, that's the next one. Um, and what else? What else are you going to do? So you've got blood going. Now you can start thinking about, you know, your CPR situation, right? And Tate's going to talk more about the lupus placement and all that, okay? Indication, when to do it, all that, why they do it, when they do it. Um, but the other myth, and he'll talk more about this, but the other myth is that lupus is not to be used as traumatic cardiac arrest, right? We can use it in traumatic cardiac arrest. It's an arrest, just like we're going to use epi, right? Because it's an arrest. So the heart needs help, the body needs help, we need blood for that to work because we're trying to get blood into the patient so that it can actually work. Okay. Um, the lucas does CPR just like their hands, right? It's the same deal. They freeze hands up and we put it on. But yes, you can use a dry arrest, but we don't want that to be high over the get there. Why? That's what we're just talking about. What's the reason? Why don't we use the lucas right away? It takes time to set up. What else? Access to the patient. Right, you've got to be able to see the patient. When someone gets now, someone should be down. Engine crew, uh, basic on the box riding, whatever. Student intern should be down there doing chest compressions during this whole thing. Right, that's fine. Do chest compressions, but we don't need to be messing around with the okay. um, Questions? Any questions on what we just talked about? It's got to be a question. Questions? Don't be afraid. Does that make sense? It's all it's making go. sense to you guys. Yeah. So um, going back to the backboarding and yeah, everything yeah. like that, what's the role of like a scoop stretcher? Because you mentioned a huge issue is obviously time with T collar and then versus access to the back of the patient. So it's like, is that sort of a happy medium? Am I able to, you know, C collar someone on the scoop or you know quickly take them off or? How long does it take to set up a scoop stretcher and put them on it and load them? And are you, is your idea of moving them from the ER to the ambulance? Yeah, is that what you're talking something about? like that, and like in the back of the unit, like either you know I could upgrade to full C spine precautions, or you know take them off completely. Right. So again, on this one, now remember every case is different, right? And Tate's going to talk a little bit more about that. But if you're if you are worried about C spine for some reason, right? That's fine. There's nothing. That's great. You're worried about C spine. I am too. I get it. But if that scenario, in this scenario, now if someone's laying in the yard and you got to move from point A to point B, you want to be deliberate about it and you want to get them there quickly, but without rushing. Okay. So whether you use a backboard or lift them onto the stretcher with three people, whatever, right? It's just you want to be you want to be moving and get them out of there so we can get them moving towards the landing zone. Okay. I think uh, with penetrating, just just 
get them on the stretcher. Yeah, I would think most of the time y'all are just going to probably lift them on a stretcher, right? It's or a backboard. That's or a throw a backboard in them. Either one. Whatever you, whatever you choose. And okay. it's like this case, like scoop stretchers, you probably like, never use. That's that's yeah. That's kind of what I was getting at. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't yeah, use trying to like secure and get it unlocked and everything. Right. You know, like, like this kind, of, just grab it. Go on. You need the backboard, don't you? You can just move them even with the focus. Yeah. High flow gasoline. High flow diesel here. High flow jet fuel. Light light. Right. So yeah. So we're just throwing them on there. But the, but again. Being careful, right? So we don't pull things off. We don't rip out an eye gel. We don't rip out an eye, right? So just, you know, but be deliberate. Like okay. a basic, basic sheet, you know, just roll them and put the sheet underneath them and sheet them up. Up and down. And up on the corner. No other questions about this case? So my case is a little bit from a different perspective. It's more from like a life life perspective. Um, we'll talk about, uh, Obviously, the case and then some things that we could have done better just so you guys can learn from like our mistakes as well. Then uh, after this, Doc will do a little bit of like a physiology lecture. Then at the end of it, we'll kind of discuss like some myths and stuff like that. So I was dispatched to a motorcycle accident in Huffman. Huffman's kind of like out in the middle of nowhere. It's just outside of Tascacito. Uh, we were notified. So when we when we go in flight, we don't get call notes kind of like you guys do. We just get whatever report is given to us by whoever's on the ground. Um, so EMS notified us that we had a below the knee amputation, and that's all we get. But having a good report on the ground really helps us out because then we can kind of prep ourselves of what equipment we may need to use or how we're going to tackle the call. Um, so, like I said, it was out in the middle of nowhere. Um, when we landed, it was like a two-lane road. Uh, I could see the motorcycle kind of off in the ditch. It had heavy damage to it. Um, there were a lot of people on scene. How many of you guys have ever seen an amputation? Okay. How many of you guys have had a patient who was alive after amputation? This is my first time actually ever seeing like an amputation. So, the way we kind of do things is uh, obviously, we have a flight nurse, flight paramedic, or sometimes the helicopters have two nurses on there. But usually, one person's primary, one person's secondary. The primary person basically assesses from the head down to the, the waist. And the secondary person basically assesses from the waist down to the feet. And the secondary person is usually the one putting the patient on the monitor. The primary person is usually managing the airway. Um, the secondary person is usually the one drawing up drugs and pushing them. That's kind of how we go into calls. So when I stepped in the back of the helicopter, um, in the back of the ambulance, I found the patient. He was supine. He was C collared. Um, I could see that he was off. His leg was amputated. Um, he had a tourniquet on. Uh, the first thing I noticed, he was pale white. He was super sweaty, super anxious. He was alert. He was able to talk to me. He was able to follow commands, but he was really, really anxious. His lips were pale, like white. You know, I looked over at their monitor. His heart rate was 160. They're like, we can't get a blood pressure. He's to Kipnik. He's breathing like 30, 35 times a minute. Um, so I immediately do my head, the pelvis. I don't see any injuries. I had clear lung sounds. Um, he just kept sounding like, man, I don't feel right. I don't feel right. So what stage of shock is this patient? Are they compensated? Are they decompensated? Are they at the point where they're about the decompensated code, like what do you guys think? Decompensated. Severely decompensated, right? So going over a little bit about shock, specifically trauma, the last thing that your body wants to give up is its blood pressure, okay? The minute that somebody's blood pressure is given up, that's usually they're already in that decompensated state. Your body will try to do everything it can to maintain hemodynamics and acid-base balance, which is why usually when you you are presented with somebody who's in an early stage of shock, they're tachycardic, they're tachypnic, okay? Those are all signs of the patient is compensating. The minute the blood pressure drops off is when they're in shock, okay? So I think my patient was more on the stage four side where he's lost over two liters of blood. Um, his pulse rate was greater than 140. I had no blood pressure. His respiratory rate was in the 30s. He was kind of becoming confused. Um, he was kind of going in and out of consciousness at some point. So 
he was very easy, okay? So things that, that's kind of going on in the body, um, so basically why you're having cool clammy skin, why do you think that's happening? Is the body pushing all the blood towards the skin or is it trying to move all the blood away to vital organs? Okay, so why is it doing What is it trying to keep alive? Brain. Heart, heart, heart brain. brain, brain, okay. Two very important things. Why are they breathing fast? Acidotic, okay. So why are they becoming acidotic? Lack of perfusion. Lack of perfusion. So essentially, they aren't able to get blood to the vital organs. If you're not able to get blood to your vital organs, you build up a lot of lactic acid. That lactic acid will make you acidotic. So that's why when you have patients who are in shock, not just hemorrhagic shock, any form of shock, they're usually breathing fast because CO2 is an acid in your blood. If you allow CO2 to accumulate, you start accumulating a lot of acid. So the way your body compensates metabolically, if you're in metabolic acidosis, if you have a lot of acid in your blood, it's through your respiratory system. So they're trying to breathe off as much acid as they can. That's why they took it there. Why are they tachycardic? Right, their blood pressure's down, okay? So the way your body tries to compensate is with its heart rate. So what happens if you have somebody whose blood pressure is low and they have a normal heart rate? What do you ask yourself? Oh, they have medication. Well, maybe their body's given up or are they on medications? What kind of medications? Exactly, right? So that's why it's good to get a history as well. Maybe not in these kind of patients because he's about to die, you know? Um, if you're able to, great. But on a normal medical patient, if they're hypotensive and have a normal heart rate, you're going to want to know, hey, are you on any kind of medications? Okay. Any questions about this? So I think my guy was pushing towards the refractory stage where he was in, about to die. He was impeding death. Okay. Um, I don't have a picture of the amputation. I didn't have time to get it, but you never seen one. This is kind of what they look like. They look nice and nasty. His was actually not below the knee. It was above the knee. So it hit his femoral artery. Okay. So when I looked, so because of where I was at, was at the head of the stretcher. Obviously, after I did my basically head to pelvis, I looked over and his leg did, had a tourniquet on and had one tourniquet. This guy, he was about 300, 350 pounds. He's about six foot two. Um, how many tourniquets do you think probably he needed? To At do? least two. Two tourniquets, right? Okay. Now, his femoral artery, which I didn't get a chance to look until later, if I pull back the flap that was covering over uh, where his knee should have been at, the femoral artery was basically exposed. You know, we possibly could have, um, if we noticed that and actually pulled the flap back in the back of the ambulance, we probably could have put... Um, something on it to basically clamp, clamp it. Uh, that's that's basically how exposed the artery was. So do you think, because there wasn't any blood around his leg, do you think that was from the fact that maybe he lost all the blood on scene or maybe because the tourniquet was working? I, did you, did the EMS put a tourniquet on? Or did they did, yeah, they put a tourniquet on. Uh, they said that there was a lot of blood on scene. Um, so when we got back there, we didn't see any blood. Uh, there was one tourniquet in place. Uh, so what we started doing basically after um, we did our initial assessment, um, well, I'll get to that. How, how, if you're in my shoes at this moment, what are you thinking? What do you want to do? So you got this guy who's, who's in really bad shock. He's very pale, he's very clammy. I have no access at this point either. They didn't have any IVs, they didn't have any IOs, and they literally just had a tourniquet and basically a couple set of vital signs with no blood. Needs blood. Needs blood, okay. So how, so they did try for access, they weren't able to get IVs. So are you gonna, you know, try to go for another IV or are you gonna IO? Mm -hmm. Exactly, right, where are you gonna IO them at? This is our central line. Does anybody know what a central line is? Okay, so what's, in the hospitals, they put in big IVs that basically give um, the hospital staff direct access to be able to infuse medications quickly, okay? Now, that's a whole sterile procedure. That's not something that we're going to be able to do in EMS. So our central line is our humoral head IO. It takes three to five seconds to get to the heart, okay? So that three to five seconds, he needs that in order to get that blood going, okay? So the first thing that I did was like, hey, man, like he was still awake. So I told him, I was like, 
I'm going to have to drill your shoulder. So I told one of the firefighters, hold his arm, drill the shoulder, and we started one unit of whole blood right away. The next thing that I had to think about, do I want to intubate this guy? Do I want to stay and play on scene? Or do I want to get going? Who would y'all do? Get going. Okay, get going. And right. resuscitate. The thing that I was thinking at the moment was he's awake. He's alert. He, he understands what's going on. So he's maintaining his airway. He's breathing. We couldn't get a pulse ox on him because his hands were ice cold and he was really sweaty. We couldn't get electrodes on him because they wouldn't stick. Um, so the only thing I had was an end title and no blood pressure. Now, after we started infusing the unit of blood, um, we started getting blood pressures. But I made the decision to just let's load and go. I had a 10 minute flight time. We'll continue resuscitation during flight. And if we have to take his airway during flight, then we will. So when I got in the back of the helicopter, we started another IO, we started another unit of blood. So we had basically two units of whole blood going. Um, it was about a 10 minute flight time. I started, once I got in the back, um, his heart rate was in the 140s and we, we got blood pressures in the 70s. Okay, so I'm like, okay, we're moving somewhere. Well, the issue was is um, he became agitated. He became more altered. He became in more distress. He started flailing his arms around. And there were two things. One, I was like, that's not a good sign. Okay, what is that a sign? If you have somebody who was initially in shock and is now starting to become more confused, are they getting better or are they getting worse? Worse. Okay, why are they why are they becoming in this state? Hypoxia. Okay, what kind of hypoxia are we doing? Are we dealing with he's not getting enough oxygen inside his lungs, or are we dealing with something else? It's not enough oxygen inside the blood. Okay, for textbook, it's called hypemic hypoxia. Okay, I never heard of that really when I went to paramedic school. So it's basically you don't have enough hemoglobin or enough red blood cells to carry oxygen around inside of your body. Okay, so even though we're infusing blood inside of him, he's not getting any better. Okay, so not only that, I didn't want to lose my IOs. That was the only thing that was basically keeping him alive at this moment was my point of access. Okay. With him flailing his arms around, what happens to your humor head IOs if they start doing this? They can come out, right? So we made a decision to just emergently intubate him. All right. So at this moment, um, his heart rate was still 140s, his systolic was 70. What choice of RSI drugs would you have? Given to this patient. Are you sedating him and paralyzing him? Are you paralyzing him? Why one versus the other? Do load of ketamine. Okay. Because he feels the shock and then paralyze. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. So we just gave him 100 a rock. Screw the sedation. Too unstable. Any any type of sedation that we would have given him, I was afraid we were going to cause him the code. Literally the whole time, why, go ahead. Can you explain to some people that don't know why we don't give uh, type of induction into yeah. shock? So basically when you're when you're in this state of shock, your catecholamines are depleted. So catecholamines is basically your epi and your norepinephrine. That is what your body releases in order to try to compensate for your state of shock. So when you're at the point where your blood pressure has dropped off, your ability to compensate is basically not working. Everything in your body has been completely depleted. So ketamine specifically, when you give ketamine, the way it works is it naturally will bring up your blood pressure. It could bring up your heart rate and also cause some bronchodilation. So it stimulates the catecholamines that are in your body, which is why it's a very rare sedation medication. Because normally when you give fentanyl, when you give Versed, it drops your blood pressure, okay? Because it relaxes everything. Well, ketamine will actually stimulate that sympathetic nervous system a little bit, which will cause your vital signs to kind of increase. But what happens when you don't have any catecholamines left in your body, and that's what ketamine wants to work off of? It does the exact opposite. It would actually tank your blood pressure, okay? So there is a good chance that even a low dose of ketamine in a patient who is in decompensated shock like this is going to take all of the reserve that they may have left or basically, if they don't have any, just going to completely tank their blood pressure when this guy's going to code. Okay. 
Now, the whole process of bagging somebody and in innovation in itself naturally brings down blood pressure. Okay, what does positive pressure do to your blood pressure? Drops it. Okay, why does it drop? It increases intrathoracic pressure. Okay, so you have these nice pair of lungs, right? Now, do we normally breathe off a positive pressure or negative? Negative. negative? negative. Okay, so the minute you start introducing positive pressure, the lungs overexpand more than they normally do. Okay, so when that happens, it starts squeezing on all the vessels inside of your chest cavity, specifically the vena cava, and that's going to limit the blood supply back to your heart, which is then going to drop your cardiac output, which means it's going to drop your blood pressure. So this whole process of just innovations in itself and bagging somebody is going to potentially drop their blood pressure. Now, when you start introducing medication that could also do that as well, you have a high likelihood of them coding. Okay, so which is why we give rocaronium only in patients who are in decompensated shock. Okay, now ideally you want to try to resuscitate these patients prior to intubating. So that means you're giving them a couple units of blood. Or if they're a medical patient, you're giving them fluid, you're giving them pressors, trying to bring up their blood pressure prior to intubating them. In this situation, we had about two units of blood in, his blood pressure still crapping. We had the two of them, we had no choice, okay? Which is why we did rock only. Rock has no side effects to it other than it's gonna paralyze you. It's not gonna affect your blood pressure, okay? We give 100 of rock because when you're in a state of shock, how well is perfusion? Not very good. So we're giving 100 because it's going to work quicker. And by working quicker, it's going to paralyze the patient quicker so we can take care of their airway. Does that make sense? OK. So literally, the whole time while we're doing this, even though we're just giving rock, I'm praying to God this guy doesn't break. OK. Luckily, we were able to intubate him. As we were landing, we secured the airway. We put him on the vent. We pulled him out. Walked into the hospital, systolic at 86, heart rate at 130, patients intubated. We started another unit of um, uh, frozen plasma because we only carried two units of whole blood. Um, but the major thing that we failed at, and this is something that Dr. Stevens just talked about, was reassessment. Okay, so normally what we do is after we pull them out in the helicopter, if you kind of gotten the stuff that you need to do done, you can kind of get up and you can kind of start re you know, reassessing your interventions. But because of our 10 minute flight time and we had to get all of this done during 10 minutes, all our focus was on everything that we're doing. So when we pulled this guy out, typically before we drop down um, from the 18th floor down to the uh, first floor to go to the ER, during that process, we're reassessing our patient. Well, because we had just gotten all this stuff done, we were reassessing the intervention we had just done, but never did we go back to the wound. Okay. Now that wound still had one tourniquet on. All right, we got down to the ER, the trauma doctor um, pulled the flat back. The vessel was still, it was almost like it was spasming. It was contracting a little bit, okay? The blood that was coming out of there, it was very minimal. It was just kind of like oozing out, nothing crazy. But he was like, hey, is this supposed to be like this? Like, oh, you know, in our head, well, you know, we knew exactly right then then that we should have put another tourniquet on. We should have reassessed our wound better. We should have managed the wound from the beginning better, but we got tunnel vision, okay? This can happen to anybody. Doesn't matter how long you've been doing this. Doesn't matter how experienced you are. You can get tunnel vision, which is why it's important to stop, slow down, reassess everything that you have done so that you don't fall in situations where you forget the basics. What is something that you as an EMT basic or a new EMT that hasn't graduated academy or that's an EMT school, we can teach you. Reassess, put on two tourniquets, stop bleeding, right? Now, that was a fail on us. That was a, a good reassurance for me that no matter how busy I am, no matter how sick the patient is, I need to stop and reassess my patient no matter what. So as far as amputations go, um, we kind of talked about this. The, the leg not bleeding on scene fooled us a little bit, okay? You know, our brains were moving quick. So when we saw it wasn't bleeding, we immediately moved on to the next couple things that we had to do, okay? Which is why we probably didn't put a second tourniquet on scene right away. But it wasn't bleeding because he lost all his blood on scene. It wasn't because the tourniquet was actually working, all right? Now, if we would have stopped and reassessed the wound, and we would have pulled it back, we probably would have seen that the vessel was still spasming, right? Could have put a second tourniquet on, 
We could have put some, um, we could have clamped it, we could have packed it, we could have done something else like that, right? So how should the bleeding be controlled in these patients? Two tourniquets, right? You get a big boy like we had, six foot two, 300 plus pounds, he needs two tourniquets. One tourniquet's not gonna do it. How do you know a tourniquet is working properly on, a, on any patient? No bleeding stop. No bleeding stop, right? So a lot of times we, we get to scenes and cops have already put tourniquets on. I would highly, highly recommend that you assess the tourniquet. If you can put your finger underneath there, it probably isn't tight enough. <laughs> if the patient still has cap refill, it's probably not tight enough. If you can feel a pulse, it's definitely not tight enough. Now, obviously, too, you got to consider does this wound need a tourniquet or not? That's another discussion. Um, sometimes uh, you may have it where law enforcement puts on a tourniquet before you get there, and you're kind of like, man, I don't really know if this needed it or not, but you may leave it on. But I would highly encourage if somebody puts a tourniquet on before you, Make sure the tourniquet is actually in place the way it's supposed to be. Now, do I think we would have missed this if this wound was still hemorrhaging? Like significantly? No. Of course, we would have seen the fact that there's still blood coming out. We wouldn't have been like, we wouldn't have neglected the fact that we needed to tighten up the tourniquet and put a second one on. Um, but because uh, there was a flap over it and we didn't pull the flap back, that was the only way that um, somebody else was able to tell us, like, hey, you should have put another tourniquet on. So what, the other thing too is they found the amputated leg and they handed us to a bag. Obviously, I didn't have time to address the amputated leg because I was addressing the patient. But do you guys know what to do with the amputated leg or amputated parts in general? Dry sterile dressing. Dry sterile dressing, good. Uh, isolate and uh, put it on ice. Um, I, do they still teach put on ice? I think it's just put in a bag, right? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, if you have a really long, if you're out in the middle of nowhere and have a super long transport time, then if you can, then it, yeah, I would put it on ice, but not directly, right? I'd always wrap it and put it over ice where it's not directly touching ice. That's the key, because that will destroy the tissue if you put it directly on ice. <laughs> so make sure it's wrapped up, uh, and then you can put it on ice. Locally, we've got such fast transport times that it's not that it's not. Yeah. Good. Plus, how often do we have ice laying next to us to put it on ice? <laughs> Go ahead. I mean, ice pack's not going to do anything. You know, just 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 wrap it up and try to keep it with the patient. Yeah. Uh, as soon as what I've heard is that clean cut. That's yeah. I was I was about to, you're, yes. You're exactly right. Okay. This is any ripped off extremity not likely to get reimplanted. Okay, but. But that doesn't mean we don't send it with the patient. Okay, if it's a clean saw, arm cut off of the table saw, that has a much higher likelihood of being successfully reimplanted. A ripped off, sheared off leg on a roadway, probably not going to get reimplanted. Okay, but it still needs to be treated like it could, because that's not our decision to make in the field. Okay, that's a dispositive decision. So one, Dr. Stevens may be able to pick you back on this, but with amputations, what I learned is when when a leg or a limb is amputated, the vessel will actually spasm, okay? Uh, which can also, it's, it's kind of like a reflex um, after the amputation to try to help control bleeding. Do you have anything to add on that? No, no that's, yeah. Vessels will spasm down and that's a natural response to the body to try to prevent yourself from bleeding to that, right? When things get reattached, they cut the vessels, they reattach the vessels, they can put little stents in there. There's all sorts of ways to re anastomose blood vessels to re perfuse that arm or leg when they put it back together. Um, how many units of blood do you think this guy got? 50. 50. Five zero? Okay. That, that's a that's a moderate resuscitation for us in the hospital. Okay, my average with that guy uh, I had the other night that was combative that I told you about. We gave him 21 reds, 21 plasmas, three bags of platelets, and a dose of cryo. So how many units of blood did we carry? So okay, so when you have somebody who's in shock, you get there no matter what it is, and I mean as far as him, um, trauma goes. You have somebody in shock, that's why you use life plan. Okay, we, we carry two units of blood, of whole blood, and we carry four units, two units of uh, plasma, and then two units of RBCs. And obviously, the helicopter can go really fast. Okay, we don't have enough blood to get these patients to downtown. They're already in decompensated hemorrhagic shock. Okay, now if you have to, you know, 
you have to do it, you know, weather permits and stuff like that. But that's why we use life plans. And you have somebody who's in shock, you know, we have everything, the tools that we need to manage until they can get to the sea. Okay. Do you want to do the next? Oh, yeah. Yeah, question. Any questions? Um, on the second tourniquet placement, I, when I was at the combat surgical hospital in Afghanistan, they had a lot of doctors got pissed off because they had the first tourniquet applied high and tight, and then they had one just above the wound, and it created this abnormal space in between, mm -hmm. uh, especially on blast injuries, slow extremities. Uh, they recommended that the second tourniquet be uh, applied directly below the first tourniquet. Yep. And that's that's what we still teach. Yeah, if you can put it as close to the other tourniquet as possible, that's ideal. Yeah. Can you explain to them? Uh, I know a lot of calls I made it where they have tourniquet placement, especially in the leg, not committed to hanging up. Uh, can you explain them the importance of putting it higher versus you know, more proximal to the wound? Or... Um, I, I'm, I'm guessing that the reason why you, you put it higher is because you don't. To me, I guess in my mind is you're kind of you you want to stop the blood flow up higher. You don't want to keep putting it. You know, it's, it's kind of like when you put an IV tourniquet on. You're putting that on to try to help uh, engorge the vessels and the veins to help you with you know being able to find a vein. So I, putting it too high may actually make the bleeding worse. I don't know if that's the best answer. We, had, we actually did have a case also. We're talking about the arteries fastening. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a case. Um, uh, Life light, and um, they put the tourniquet too low, and the artery actually went back up inside. Mm -hmm. uh, so they had it occluded initially, but went back inside because yeah. they were seeing the leg get engorged. Yeah, they didn't put it up high enough. Sometimes when they'll spasm, they'll, they'll, they'll retract back up into the leg. Exactly. So it's always better to get yeah. closer. Plus, your arteries run closer to the outside of your body right here, so you're going to get a better pinch point. Yeah, we always uh, encourage high and tight tourniquets okay that's both leg and arm so up by the axilla on an arm that you're putting a tourniquet on and then up by the groin as high as you can get it um we had that i can't remember i think <laughs> that gunshot to the groin that kid sitting in the car right that was you and me right yeah so the the so did a great job he did the best he could the, the kid still had pants on which made it really tough to tighten that tourniquet down but he shot himself high in the thigh and the so did a great job i mean tried to get a tourniquet on before we got there put it right on it, put it right on it basically yeah so it wasn't quite high enough now the the wound was low enough to get a tourniquet above it but barely uh, but we re got it attached and then we put a second one on it kind of went over the wound that's fine but we were just doing our best to get a second one on there when life light was landing uh, but that was a great example of high and tight. You've got to get as high up in that brain as you can and really cinch it down. That's another reason the clothes have to come off. Okay, you've got to be able to get clothing off so your tourniquet will work, right? You can pack the wound, you can put pressure while someone's getting the tourniquet high and tight. All right, but yeah, go as high as you can. If you need a second one, go right below the height. Okay, yes. Uh, I was going to say, um, if it's put to like a leg for an adult, just always put two, you know, don't sit there and try and make the decision of, oh, this guy is kind of big, he might need to, it's easy to just put two on any leg, or arterial bleeding. Yeah, legs should always get two for the most part. That's a good rule of thumb. Even if yeah, wait, it looks like it's controlled, just get a second one. When the dust settles and you have time, just throw a second one on and cinch it down, like that case y'all had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guarantee you that in the future, Tate's always gonna put a second leg tourniquet on. <laughs> um, yes. Dr. Sterling, don't get me. We're going to talk about that right now. Okay. Okay. Physiology and innovation, spontaneous versus apneic RSI. The first case was apneic. He was on arrest. So you don't need anything, right? Another myth in trauma is we always get sedation. I will fight to the death with no other and no other I will fight to the death. People are trained in medicine different ways. I do trauma resuscitation for a work. That's what I do. All the stuff you guys are seeing out there, I get those patients and I go up. I have to assess them. People in shock are anesthetized. Sounds weird. But if you're like the one case uh, case that Tate just talked about or mine, who's an arrest. If you're in arrest, you are anesthetized. You are out. You are unconscious. GCS3. What does GCS mean? What is it? It's 
Okay, but what is it? Just a way of determining how Okay, it's a way of determining how responsive a patient is. What does that mean in the logical system? It's in the definition. Toma. Anyone know what Toma means? Toma says. What's Toma says? Sleep, they didn't understand like now. They didn't put awareness. <laughs> yes, thank you. State of unawareness, unconscious, right? Like some of y'all in here right now. <laughs> no, most y'all are going to see us at five, six. Maybe it's a the stair. <laughs> All right, so Glasgow coma scale. What's the lowest number? Three. 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 We give you three points for showing up to the party. All right. All right, you could be dead right there. DRT. And you're at three at that first case, right? Second case, I don't know, he's slipping. Nine, ten. Didn't matter. He was dying. There, right? <laughs> he was on if the road down to in a coma. Do you need sedatives? No. If you're the second case and you're about to die, your systolic pressure is 80 at best, and you're getting combative, you're getting dizzy, you're throwing your arms around. How much sedation do you think that patient is? Zero. Not low dose. Um, the reason is that I have knocked people off the cliff in the trauma bed, giving one or two CCs at a time. A very tiny dose of chemical. They don't need it. They're not going to remember. If this guy remembers getting innovated on the helicopter, he's allowed to shake his hand. And so I'm glad you remembered all that because you're alive to tell me. Are we trying to suppress because the he probably wouldn't be alive to tell you the rock remember is. if you gave him help. Well, that's not okay. Right. You will, you might yeah. arrest that patient. Now, if you innovate and they have vitals for, for coming up and it looks like they need some sedation, then by all means, give them some. But they have to earn it. You got to earn that sedation. They have to prove to you they have enough catecholamines left in their body to maintain a good blood pressure on heart rate and then sign it. And then they get some sedation. Okay. There's this myth that all RSIs have to have a sedative first before doing it. That is absolutely false. Okay. I've seen a lot of patients literally going to arrest and not in the ER after they see RSI with a full dose of RSI drugs and get big ventilations, so they can do that like this. And now they're going to adjust motion. Then they come up with the OR with CPR. Okay, so please be very, very careful with sedatives. They're extremely potent in shock states. So if the patient's dizzy, combative, moaning, localizing, and that's all they're doing, I would be very, very hesitant to give them any sedative or anything. Okay. Get the rock on board, give it in. Now, how long does rock growing and take in these cases? Medics. Maybe. That does. What happens in shock? What's going on in shock? Basics know this. What's going on in the shock state? We've been talking about it all morning. My perfusion, my perfusion, I have low cardiac output, low blood pressure. Right? When you have low blood pressure and cardiac output, what's, how long does your circulation time take to get drugs to the receptors? Longer, longer. So medics, let the drug work. You got to let that drug work, okay? It's probably at least a minute to a minute and 20 seconds. That's a long time to wait for our brain. But I think one of the problems we have with innovating on our side sometimes is we don't get the rock long enough to hold. And the poor intern is trying to scissor them out open with the blade and are struggling because the patient's not fully relaxed yet. So give the drug time to work, especially if they're in shock. Okay, you got to let that drug circulate and actually work. It's magic, it works fast, but it doesn't work that fast. Okay, it's not 10 seconds later. And I have to slap the resident's hand sometimes to take out the laryngoscope because I push the rock, and 10 seconds later, they're picking the laryngoscope up. I'm like, no, wait, you got to let the drug work. You actually have to let it circulate and get to the receptor store. Okay. Any questions on that? Any other questions on when to get ketamine, low dose, when not to? She said that, but I think, I think last time we talked about the low dose being more of a medical. That's okay. That's right. Yeah. Pressure's ready. That's fine. I think that's what she. Yeah, I mean, if they're alert and talking to you and all that, by all means, get them because they now you know they have enough uh, blood pressure if they're alert and talking and following commands. Then yeah, give them a very low dose. Okay, I mean, you can always get more, but you can't get back what you give them. That's that's hard. Yeah. 
uh, gold shop reserve that they have. We talked about all this already. Right take one over some of this already, right so I'm not going to spend. Physiology. So you're you're maintaining their blood pressure, you're resuscitating them, the way you ventilate them, the way you put on the ventilator, all that stuff, you're controlling. So you gotta be really, really careful um, once you get them intubated. Okay, so managing the patient after we intubate them is just as important as how we lead up to innovate them. Okay, so those management decisions are critically important. Um, so you we were just talking about the, the um, low-dose ketamine stuff again. If it's a medic to RSI or a short or something like that, yeah, by all means, give a low dose. But just give a lower dose. If someone's got enough perfusion where they're still looking at you and still talking and they can follow up against, that's a different kind of patient. They get some ketamine, the low dose. You can always get more, you just can't say the way that you give them. So I give a low dose. Uh, get them, get the voice to get a set of vitals immediately. And that's where the hemosphere comes in. We're going to talk about today. Uh, one of the problems we have too, once you get, once you finish the airway procedure, you need to be hitting that button and get another blood pressure, right? Right away. That's what we do in the operating room. I hit it right away because I don't have an A line yet. We're working on putting an arterial on. Hemisphere dominant factor is going to go over with you today. Hopefully, this is going to really be a game changer for us with the physiological monitoring. Um, that's what we see a lot in the operating room, right? They come, distended abdomen, big bullet wound here, okay? Bleeding out into the abdomen. So again, we have to be very, very careful with how we manage this person and putting them to sleep and innovating. Okay, so um, don't forget, rock only, okay? And make sure it's 100 milligrams. We changed that protocol because a lot of people are still getting 50 of rock for some reason. It's 100 milligrams of rock for every one of some. Okay. Um, we just talked about all this, right? So I'm not going to go through all this too much again. We've kind of covered all this already. Volume resuscitation is key in these patients. And then our hemisphere advanced monitoring. That's going to be our newest, latest uh, trick to be able to help manage, uh, you know, critical decision making, quick decisions for the medics based on this monitor. Um, paralytic only, we talked about that. This is the monitor. Dominic's going to go over all this with you all in the back. That's the hemisphere monitor. It's what it looks like. He gives us lots of good information on there. Um, we took a picture of that was us playing with it when he came out uh, in the, to the station uh, a couple months ago um, just to see where we're going to put it. So that's down the road. We're not mounting it in the, in the ambulance right now. We'll just be kind of with the patient on the side of the patient wherever you all can get it. But we'll the supervisor is going to get schooled up on using this thing. We're probably going to roll it out starting tomorrow. We're field testing it this one, okay, just to make sure it works in the field course. This monitor has not been field tested yet. The company wouldn't give us one to play with because they have not field tested it. It's only been tested in hospital settings. So it's a liability issue. So now that Kermit has bought a bunch of these things, Dominic was able to secure one for us for training purposes, and we're going to do our own field trial to be able to Pretty cool stuff. First place in the country to do something like this. So this is very exciting. All right. Uh, conclusions, have a plan and route to scene. You guys should start thinking about prior priorities in route to a scene like this, right? Who's who's gonna delegate what role, right? The you know, engine crew rolls, rolls up first. Basics need to jump on this patient, start looking for blood and cut clothes off, right? Um, so have designated roles. Who's gonna do what? Use your march algorithm, right? This is the one we use in the military, that march algorithm, right? Massive hemorrhage, airway obstruction. Um, you're going to go through and rule out your, um, you know, tension pneumothoraces, respiratory compromise, okay? And controlling hemorrhage, circulation, feeling pulses. Do you feel pulses anywhere? Put your hands on pulse places. Are they going to rest? Um, and then start CPR and start doing all your stuff that we talked about earlier, okay? And then reassess the trauma naked, and then warming measures, right? Trauma shears, get them out, use them, get all the clothes off. And a mental checklist of what you're going to miss. What is going to kill this patient in front of you? Well, you know what's going to kill them, right? Massive hemorrhage, airway obstruction, tension in the floor, right? Uh, do what's indicated. What's going to kill your patient in order of priority? Do what's right for the patient. Tourniquets, tourniquets, please put them on. When in doubt, put a tourniquet on. 
Don't worry about, oh, the doc's going to get mad at me. Like, if they get mad at you, fine. Tell them to call me. Okay? If they didn't need a tourniquet, who cares? They will take it off and they them. If you think they need a tourniquet, put the tourniquet on and put a second one on if it's the leg. Okay, make sure that tourniquet's working. Uh, direct pressure, wound packing, uh, uh, chest decompression, needle chest decompression, and their ABCs, right? And then prioritize, prioritize your treatment. All right, so if they need blood and they're still alert and looking at you, drill them, get blood stuck. All right, so let's not take their airway right away. Right, let's not knock them over the edge of the cliff. And now we're doing chest compressions. Okay, let's get access, start blood, and then get them down the road if you can't without trying to take their airway. Um, if life flight's going to fly, y'all can make that decision when you land whether or not you're going to take the airway before they fall. Okay, depending on how they're being on the and how the patient is sitting. Uh, reassess, reassess, reassess. I cannot stress that enough. You have to reassess your patients. I get on the residents and the students in the hospital about this all the time. They don't reassess the patient. So always reassess. They teach you this in BTLS, PHTLS, IHTVLS, or whatever, right? All these classes, right? But you got to reassess your patient once you do an intervention. Okay. All right. I think that's it. Questions? I want to say something for the people here. Um, you saw in there, you said trauma here. So one of the things that I, know, I notice a lot is people don't cut clothes off. And they go off the patient's words. So when these patients are injured, sometimes you have a distracting injury that they're focusing on their attention to, and they might have an injury down here. There's been a couple calls I've gone on where when we, when we do cut the pants, cut everything off, they do have an injury there. So, I mean, especially if you're flying, there should be no reason that they're not naked when they go on that helicopter. Because you can't trust what they're saying when they're, when they're hurt. Because when you're hurt, your body responds, you have comp compensatory mechanisms that are not going to feel certain things. So make sure you cut the clothes off. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. We can't re we we just can't say that enough, right? You've got to take clothes off to see the patient. You're going to miss things if you don't disrobe the patient. And then don't forget to cover them back up once you've assessed them and treated them. Okay, and try to maintain normothermia if you can, or at least start warming them back up. In the middle of summertime um, here in Houston, every single one of my patients when I make it to the operating room is already cold. That's 150 degrees outside. They are why is that? Why are they cold? I heard a lot of moments. <laughs> yeah, yeah, AC in the box is a big one, right? They will always got air conditioning. Turn that AC off, cover them up. The reason is that your blood is what keeps you warm. When you lose all your blood, there's nothing left to keep you warm. Right? You're in shock. So that's why they're cold. You have to keep them warm. Try to wrap them up best you can for a transport. Okay. Anything else? Any other questions? The only thing I was going to add is if uh, you have somebody who's in traumatic arrest and they look like they'd be too big to put on a Lucas, don't probably don't fly them. The reason why we can use them in the helicopter is because there's only two of us. If you can't put a, if we can't put a Lucas on somebody to transport them in a helicopter, it's not going to be very effective for us. Uh, we're not going to be able to get much done because. One of us is going to be doing compressions the whole time. We can't stand up back there. Uh, you can lean over the patient. There's just something to consider. So that's about it. Um, we went, you got about a few minutes over, few yeah. minutes over but uh, go ahead and take about five minute break. And then essentially what we'll do is we'll try to split everybody up. It's about 45 people right now. So it's going to be about seven people a group, maybe a little bit over. Okay. So There's going to be six stations. It's going to be an IO station. There's going to be a hemisphere station. It's going to be a bleeding control station. There's going to be a pelvic binder, traction splint, and then there's going to be a fast. 